Welcome to St. Mary's, the University Church. It's wonderful to invite members of the Prayer Book Society to this celebration of Choral Evensong this evening. And it's also particularly poignant to welcome you to this church today. This is a place where Thomas Cranmer was tried and eventually condemned to death. The building still bears the scars of his trials. There is the pillar damaged to make room for the staging where Cranmer stood. And the poppy heads on these stools were destroyed to accommodate the staging where his accusers sat. As we contemplate the scars of this building, we give thanks for Cranmer's courage, for his faithfulness and devotion, and we pray that the light of his witness may shine with renewed confidence as we bear witness to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do, when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus you our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, open thou our lips.
The first lesson is written in the 43rd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. Here endeth the first lesson. The second lesson is written in the second chapter of St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, beginning at the eighth verse. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, 
yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here endeth the second lesson. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. with right. 
I shall take as my text this morning this line from the 14th verse of the second chapter of the second letter of Paul to Timothy. Strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is, perhaps, the perpetual immature schoolboy within me, but I do love a good bit of subverting. Strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. This may seem a strange part of our lesson to hone in on for someone like me. St Paul is strongly warning Timothy against needless word games and pointless theological arguments, pointing out that they subvert or turn aside the faithful from the true path which he would have them set on. Now, whilst I haven't much patience for theological arguments, pointless or otherwise, I do like a needless word game. So why choose this text and why preach on it on this day? Well, we might argue that the meaning of subverting initially found in the epistle is different from the subversion that we know and I at least love. It all depends, I suppose, on one's starting position. Now, if we find ourselves in the midst of a world and an order, a church and a state, where the path of the gospel is sure, where the strivings that do occur are only in the direction of the kingdom of God, well, in such a case, to subvert those who sought to hear and to act in accordance with what they had heard would, quite truly, be an act of wickedness. But if we find ourselves in a place where no such trajectories are clear, no such unity of purpose appears to exist, where to strive over words to no profit is not an occasional occasional condemnable exception, but rather the seemingly endless norm, well then, surely, to try and subvert our hearers with vitality, grace, life, and truth is the very least we can do as Christians. The life of Thomas Cranmer offers examples of these contrasting premises in abundance. Nobody can accuse him of striving about words with no profit when it comes to his liturgy. Each word is so carefully chosen. The ramifications, political and theological, of each statement and prayer are so deliberately poured over, and it remains the lodestar of our theology and our practice. And yet, when he came to this place in his final days to stand trial, he did seek to subvert his hearers to turn them first by argument and latterly, a few metres away from here on Broad Street, by bravery, to turn them from courses and deeds that he knew to be wrong. Indisputably then, subversion has many modes, and so too did Dr. Cranmer. It struck me as a good mode focus for our meditations as we celebrate in this place, because by doing so, we subvert any number of expectations of any number of hearers. Our celebration today subverts expectations about the prayer book, about the Church of England, about age, about vitality, theology, or any hundred other things that you care to mention. Although, I confess, for my part, I delight most in the subversion that twinkles across the centuries, in the very act of us marking the martyrdom of Archbishop Cranmer and soaking ourselves in the glories of his liturgy and worship, in this, the very place where his efforts were declared null and void at his trial. So I intend to say a word in favour of this other, latter subversion. The subversion that gets under the skin in unexpected ways. The subversion that opens ears of hearers which were previously thought stopped up. The subversion that is a converting ordinance. It is to be hoped that today will, for someone listening and watching, subvert their expectations and thus sow the seed of a richer narrative, a deeper faith and a closer walk with Jesus Christ. Frankly, whilst I do not wish to denigrate the Church of England's ability to still stir up strife to no profit and argue at length about words to the detriment of us all, in constructive terms, this other subversion, this subverting of the world, is the only option that we have as a weapon in our armory in the latter day. We live, my brothers and sisters, in a very different world to Dr. Cranmer's. We are no longer in a position of dominance, of assumed access 
and power. Subversion, then, is our best tactic when it comes to the gospel. Of course, it is not just in Cranmer's life when events made the subverting of his hearers the best way of communicating the gospel and to be subversive again. He surely would not want a hagiographical rehearsal of his life as we mark what he died for today. So it is our bounden duty to observe as well that Holy Scripture too has plenty of examples where subversion has proved to be in the gospel's service. For what else does Moses do but subvert the whims of Pharaoh and the devices of his wizards? What does Rahab do but subvert the expectations of Joshua's men and of all Jericho itself, and so thus deliver it into the Lord's hands? Does not Paul himself subvert the assumptions of the Athenians and what it is to know God in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts? And does not Christ, in each and every parable he speaks, subvert both the hearers whom he addresses in the gospel and we who hear him here and now? He subverts our worldliness, our wickedness, and our pride. Yes, indeed, Christ subverts. And yet by subverting, he conforms, conforms us to his love. If the church is on the edge and forced into acts of subversion, then it has good biblical precedent to be there. Yet there are, of course, wheels within wheels, my brothers and sisters, and we who love and venerate the Book of Common Prayer, who feel the power of Cranmer's doctrine echo in his liturgy, who know the fresh comfort of Jesus in ancient patterns of speech, we are supposedly still further on the edges. We are yet more distant from the supposed mainstream. We are told that such attachments are awkward romanticisms or reactionary fantasies as opposed to what we know them truly to be. That is, the wellsprings of refreshment in an otherwise barren and dry landscape. But let us delight in such tired slander, for it is, I promise you, increasingly no longer true as a generation picks up its books of common prayer once more. But let us use this distance, use this false representation, and let us use it for holy subversion. In short, let us not weep in our wilderness. For what we know from Cranmer's life, what we know from Holy Scripture, and what we know from the story of God's glorious salvation is that it is from the valleys filled with supposedly dry bones that our Lord brings forth life. And it is amidst the flame and smoke of public suppression and contempt that he lights candles such as will never go out. If the history of the reviving movements of the Holy Ghost, be that in the Bible or in the timeline of our own Church of England, is anything to go by, then here and now is perhaps the greatest opportunity we have had since the Reformation for the resubversion of the people of England by the principles of the Book of Common Prayer. We have, of course, been in these situations before, this Church having played witness to many of them. Can anyone present on that day have known at the denouement of Cranmer's own career that he would seal his liturgy on the hearts of generations? Can contemporaries who heard him preach have known how many Wesley would win back for Christ? Can even the most eager devotees of Keeble have realised that his sermon, preached here, would have ramifications for the church even today? Even Keeble himself was apprehensive, pessimistic about what could and might be done. In the foreword to the publication of that sermon, he imagined future generations looking at the sorry state of our ecclesial body and saying, there was once here a glorious church. Let us feel ourselves able to subvert our hearers once more, brothers and sisters. Namely, let us subvert those whose instinct is always and only to seek out a narrative of gloom and add another layer of subversion and declare that there is still here a glorious church, still glorious in her stated faith, still glorious in her preserved order, and still and most glorious of all in her greatest jewel, her people. For there truly are none like them. And they show forth glory in the love and care and strength and wisdom and wit that they lay and ordained old and young, near and far, show forth every day. The Book of Common Prayer envisions the very highest standard of worship 
in beauty and in theology for the ordinary people of God. That is because it knows them to be the church's primary care and, if led into lives of righteousness and peace, her glory too. When I look at the Church of England, I say again, here is still a glorious church. But how are we to find our pride again? Well, first and foremost, let us strive not over words to no profit. We have built forests of words which serve us no use. Nobody will lie on their deathbed, my friends, using their final gasps of air to allow a diocesan strapline to break forth from their lips. That there will always be a need for specialised language, I do not dispute. And indeed, it would suggest that we do not care about the definitions of the divine if we did not have such a language. And it is profoundly patronising towards God's people to suggest that they cannot cope with there being some. Yet we are trading our old words, carefully rounded on and selected for use by judicious hands like Cranmer's, for vain ones generated by machine or algorithm. In short, we are in danger of forgetting our distinct, our holy vocabulary, which is, after all, the building blocks of the Book of Common Prayer, and replacing it with the jargon of the secular. We cannot subvert our hearers by plying them with the language they see on the spreadsheets and emails on a day-to-day -day basis. We cannot subvert our hearers when our language is that not of the beauty of shared faith, but of a corporate culture for which they care nothing. For these strivings cannot possibly profit in our current worldly age if they have no hope of subversion. Let us, in short, speak beautifully of God and then as plainly as possible about everything else and attempt to serve God by our subversions of the world. Let us subvert the world's pride by true expressions of humility. In a world of entitlement and self-righteousness, in a world where it is once again the norm to denigrate the human value of others on the basis of superficial differences, we do not presume. We have erred and strayed. We are not worthy. Become deeply powerful and subversive phrases as we remind ourselves and our world that the need for saving grace is not only found in those to whom we would most eagerly impute sin, but those we agree with, those we love, indeed, our very selves as well. Let us pray too for leaders bold enough to cast their offending hands, for my friends, the hands of the church have offended in ways we cannot even begin to imagine. Let us pray for leaders bold enough to cast their offending hands into the fire. Let us subvert the world's vanity by true expressions of lament. If we present Christianity as mere Panglossian gurning, then we will, shown to be, we, will shown to be, we will be shown to be fools eventually. To have been relentlessly cheerful this year would have been more. It would have been actively wicked. A church must be big enough to lament and brave enough to mourn, strong enough to be weak. Cranmer gifts us a view of the world in his burial of the dead, in his baptism service, even in his service of holy matrimony. A view of the world that is unafraid, unafraid to name the world as broken. Let us use those services and have the courage to do the same, to name the world as broken. For in so doing we will find its repair, its and our repair, by Jesus Christ all the more sweet. Let us subvert the world's heartlessness by living in love and charity with one another. Let us not only continue our work feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, tending the sick, burying the dead, and comforting those who mourn, as so many of those glorious Church of England people do up and down this country. But let us encourage each and every church to view it as nothing less than the mandated duty of the Christian and the natural living out of the Gloria, the angel's song, with which we properly end Holy Communion. Cranmer envisioned arms and oblations as the natural extension of the gifts offered at the Lord's table, not as optional extras, but as our bounden duty. Indeed, he viewed, as anyone who has read the Canon Precentor of Liverpool's masterful writing on the topic will know, he viewed the whole duties of worship and alms given as bound up in one service. Let us glory in what we do, strive each of us to do a little more, and bind our hearts and hands as one, in service of the one who suffered to have both pierced.
for our fallen humanity. Let us subvert the world's fear by true expressions of hope. We live in an age where fear triumphs. People fear the other. They fear the monotony of their own lives. They fear the power of technology, and they also fear the primeval dark. They fear words, and they fear consequences for their actions. They fear being unnoticed, and they fear truly being themselves. It is a world built on straw. Cranmer too knew fear, in this place most of all. But he also knew that to ground one's life in the reading, marking and inward digestion of Holy Scripture and in the making of Holy Communion is to place one's identity in the ever-rolling pattern of salvation. That which we are promised drives out fear. May we have the confidence to state that this is so again and again, for it is both our hope and our glory. Finally, let us subvert the very world itself by the power of the cross and by the hope of an everlasting glory. For whatever lies ahead in the short or medium term, for the Church of England or for you or for I, we are bound together by the hope in one who is greater than us all. We can but utter those words, the final words ever spoken by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, and uttered not, I earnestly believe, to no prophet. We can only say, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Cranmer's whole life was one of subversion, and his afterlife has been one of subversion as well. For generation after generation in the church, in this land, his words, not words strived about to no profit, his words have subverted the hearts, minds, the pride and the fears of their hearers, and have called them to lives of service and devotion, and inheritances of worship and glory. Let us be confident to allow those words to do so once again, and declare that here there is, here there can be, a glorious church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As we come to God in prayer, we begin by recalling and remembering the martyrdom of Thomas Cranmer. The account is read by the Oxford Branch Chaplain of the Prayer Book Society. This extract from the Memorials of Thomas Cranmer by the 17th century historian John Stripe relates the story of his martyrdom in Broad Street, Oxford. The Queen had no intention of sparing Cranmer's life despite his enforced recantation, and thus on the 21st of March 1556 he was taken to the University Church to declare publicly his reconciliation to the unreformed church and its teaching before his execution. The fallen primate, whom an eyewitness described as an image of sorrow, earnestly exhorted the people to love God, to obey the king and queen, to live charitably as brethren, and to be liberal to the poor. After reciting his faith, to the surprise and consternation of his audience, he continued, Now I come to the great thing which troubleth my conscience more than any other thing that I ever said or did in my life, that is, the setting abroad of writings contrary to the truth, which I here renounce and refuse as things written with my hand contrary to the truth which I thought in my heart, and writ for fear of death, and to save my life if it might be and that is, all such bills as I have signed with my own hand since my degradation. As for the Pope, I refuse him with all his false doctrine. He was immediately hurried to the stake, and as a sign that this unexpected recantation was final, he stretched out his right hand and thrust it into the flame, crying with a loud voice, This hand hath offended. As soon as the fire got up, he was very soon dead, never stirring or crying the whole while. Almighty God, by whose grace and power, by holy martyr Thomas Cranmer triumphed over suffering and despised death, grant, we beseech thee, that enduring hardness and waxing valiant in fight we may, with the noble army of martyrs, receive the crown of everlasting life. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, as we remember on this day all those who struggled and suffered on both sides in the upheavals of the Reformation, we pray for your Church in our time. May we be informed in our faith by the questions they raised and the convictions they held, and may our sorrow at their suffering lead us to seek ever greater unity within the Church and ever great under greater understanding between Christians of different traditions. Lord of all, whose reality is greater than any one mind can conceive, and whose love is more perfect than any one heart can express. As we recall both the insights and the pain of the Reformation era, renew our commitment to one another in our shared striving after the truth of the faith, that working together in unity, we may discover more deeply the truth of your nature and the meaning of the purposes you have for us, through our shared Teacher and Saviour, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we pray at this time for our nation and all those affected by the current pandemic. We give thanks for the work of scientists within this university in securing an effective vaccine. We pray for health workers and all who care for others. We pray for those whose lives are threatened daily by hunger, poverty, or lack of shelter, for those who live in fear of the violence of war or oppression, and for all who struggle to find their fullness of life while coping with illnesses of mind, body, or spirit. God of love, in whom all our wounds are healed and our suffering is soothed, Send into our spirits your healing mercy, that all that is hurting within us may be comforted, and all that is broken within us made whole, that we would be enabled to bring to those we meet words of encouragement, hope, and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who wake or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, give rest to the weary, sustain the dying, calm the suffering, and pity the distressed. All for your love's sake, O Christ our Redeemer. Amen. We say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
peace of God which passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>